You're listening to the Low Pressure Podcast, the podcast for skiers. Presented by CMH Heli Skiing and Peak Performance. The Low Pressure Podcast is sponsored by CMH Heli Skiing, where you can choose from 11 unique locations and experiences, including four, five, six, and seven day signature trips, the brand new single day trips. You can do small groups with just you, four friends, and a guide. Or the private and exclusive, where you get the whole place just to yourself. So find your next adventure at cmhheli.com. The Low Pressure Podcast is also sponsored by Peak Performance. There are many ways to make it down a mountain, but the best line is your line. And the adventure is there, so make it yours. Visit peakperformance.com and get the gear to unlock your free ride spirit. We'll, we'll start this again. Yeah. I'm going to ask you the exact same question I asked you a minute ago before I changed the audio segment. Um, this is a cool house, man. Like you said, you grew up here? Yeah, I uh, grew up here. been uh, living here since I was a kid, and uh, it's had some renovations since then, but uh, great place to be. And this is home, so you just kind of took it over from, from your parents? or uh, It's actually my mom's place, and um, she's here just for a couple months of the year, so... I look after the house during the summer months and uh, right. yeah, live here. Where's mom now? Uh, oh. She's in Australia at the moment. Oh no, wait, living yeah. life. Yeah, she's actually looking after her parents. Oh really? Um, so yeah, they're getting older. So you have Australian, are you, you're part Australian? Yeah, I'm born in Australia actually. Really? Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah. Might. Oh yeah, no. Nah. <laughs> yeah, no, I don't have an accent. You just said, yeah, no, I don't have an accent. So it's still buried in there deep down. It's oh, in the I genes. I don't think so. No, I was born there and then I moved to Roslyn as uh, a baby. For real? Yeah. Oh, I also cool. grew up in Alaska in the summertime. So that's it's like Alaska and Canada. Yeah, much. I was kind of wondering about that. So is your mom like full Aussie, grew up in Australia, that sort of thing? Yes, she grew up in Australia and uh, she left Oz around 16, I think, went to New Zealand, started skiing there. Really? Uh, met a guy named Jim Gove. He was a photographer and they traveled around, went to Alaska, came here to Canada and did a bunch of ski adventures and lots of uh, backcountry ski camping trips. Sweet. And settled in Roslyn and had a little a little Dane. Yeah, pretty much. Very cool, man. So you, so you spent a lot of your time, where did you spend most of your winters? Like in Alaska or here? Uh, my winters were spent here in Roslyn, BC and my summers were spent in Alaska. Right. So are you like a triple citizen? Um, yeah, technically. Do you have all three passports? Yeah, I don't know what the legalities are around that, but they shh, did give shh, me shh, that. So. We won't talk about it too much more, yeah. but like, so you can like, when you go in Australia, you Aussie passport. When you go to Canada, Canadian passport. When you go to the States, US passport. Yep. Yeah, you're supposed to um, go into the country uh, on the citizenship that you have. So Right. Yep. That's awesome. Yeah. Oh my God, man. Like I'm, uh, that's like my dream. It's like my dream goal in life to have like another passport. My mom's dad was English and I was trying to figure out if we could do the like literal grandfather kind of clause to try and figure it out. Yeah. Um, but I don't think they did it through like the a female side it has to be through like a, like a male's lineage oh, interesting. or something along those lines. And, but I don't think she had hers either. So it was like oh well not a not gonna happen well i would say it's like a blessing and a curse in its own way it um there is definitely a lot of complications that comes with having multiple citizenships so such as good to know um mainly it's like tax implications so depending on the countries that you're a a dual citizen of right you can have uh, tax treaties Mm -hmm. and so you have to learn the tax laws so like so like through your skiing career were you like obviously most most likely getting paid in u.s dollars right so with the podcast i i work with american companies and with canadian companies i prefer to get paid in american dollars because you know it's it's that instant 30 percent boost right so would you are were you kind of registered as like an athlete or a business within the states or in the canada how did that work um so i'm i was actually australian american Okay. Those are my two uh, citizenships. I was born in Australia. My dad was actually from Alaska. Mm-hmm. So I was uh, Australian-American. Right. And I only just became Canadian about, I don't know if it's been like four years ago or something. Right. Um, did you so, full, I, did you, so you had to do the full citizenship test and everything? Yeah, yeah. So I went through the full immigration process as a professional skier. Oh, no way. Yeah. 
Oh, sweet. So like where, so I guess you folk, you based, obviously we based out of the States as like an American pro skier. Yeah. I mean, when I would talk to companies, it's like, oh yeah, I live in Roslyn, BC, but, uh, I would uh, get paid in the United States. Right. Right. Yeah. It's funny. I, I was talking to someone, um, the other day about, uh, like uh, ski companies that are based like majority in the States that don't really see Canada quite as importantly as we think they should, like from the media point of view. And, uh, it was like, yeah, Canada, it's like where all our athletes live and where we film all of our segments, but it's not where we sell any of our skis. Yeah. Hey, that's interesting. Right. Yeah. They didn't say that we're, I'm just like paraphrasing on our, like our, our conversation of, of like, you know, making jokes, but that's interesting. Cause it's, if you can focus your attention from the States, that's key. Cause up here it's tiny little. Yeah. Well, I guess if you look at it, technically speaking, the U S is a much larger population base, huge, but at the same time, the terrain and the type of skiing that goes on in Canada is uh, pretty crazy. And, uh, there's like a lot of roots in backcountry skiing that stems from the, the Canadian side of things. Right. Exactly. So it's that funny little, it's a, like, like I said, it, it, I just, that, that's why I brought it up because it stuck with me. It's like, it's where all of our athletes live and where yeah. we film all our segments, yeah. but it's not where we do our business, yeah. right? which is kind of silly because, you know, people here, they give her. Yeah, totally. Do you, obviously you grew up here. Um, is there, and you could have settled in Alaska if you wanted to, I'm sure. Is there a reason why, like, have you spent winters in Alaska as well? Like you said, you kind of did the winters here. Did you ever go and spend winters up there or like just um, suss it out to say, Hey, maybe is this something I want to do? I did spend, I think like the beginning of one season there mm -hmm. and, um, I trained with the racers at Alieska. Right. And, uh, it was really fun. I skied there for a bit, met a kid named Luke Tanaka. I don't know if you've ever heard of him. He's, um, I think he even got involved. I don't know if it's, if I'm right in saying this with Odessa at some point, but with the artist, the musical artist? Yeah, I could be wrong on that. I don't know. You know, things change over the years. But anyways, I hung out with Luke Tanaka up there, and we were hitting some natural Alieska jumps in between race training. It was definitely pretty cool. Um, but no, I didn't really consider skiing up there. I was super young at the time anyway. So. Right, right. You're like, this is home. I, I was wondering, like, even, like, further down in your career when you, like, are traveling around the world and stuff, and you're like, oh, Alaska, I'm kind of from here too, you know? Go spend time here. Maybe it's like when you get into like your twenties and you're doing AK segments or or whatever. You're like, oh, maybe I could just stick around here because you know I kind of have some roots here. Yeah, I mean, um, we have a house up there. My mom does, so I could definitely go up there if I wanted to. Right. Um, so if you but... go on like a like a hel on those heli film trips and there's the, all those down days, you can just go home. Yeah, no, not quite. Like we usually are in like Haynes or something like that, but. Um, one year I wasn't with TGR actually, but they did fly out of the Matanuska Valley there, right where our house is. So I wish I was on that trip. Cause I was like, you know, we could probably stay at the house, but, uh, go to the house and cook yeah. dinners and do whatever. Right. Yeah. Your mom's up there. Yeah. Yeah, her, yeah. She's up there in the summertime. So, right. And just close She just shuts it down for the, for the summer yeah. or for the winter, I guess. Yeah. Gets out of Dodge. Yeah, she works up there in the summer, runs a clothing business called Alaska Girls Clothing. Oh, cool. And she's been doing that for uh, almost 20 years now, I think. Oh, very nice. Yeah, and it's uh, expanded, and it's a pretty big deal, I'd say. there's uh, The original slogan was Alaska Girls Kick Ass, so her bumper stickers are like all over the state, and you'll even see them down in California, and yeah, it's pretty cool. That's a brilliant slogan, because I bet you a lot of the people may not even know it's a clothing brand. Yeah. Yeah, totally. It's just a rallying point, and then they, yeah. they might see it and be like, oh, yeah, check it out. Yeah, totally. Interesting. I was thinking I was thinking about the other day, bumper stickers. We've got some stickers being built or being made for the LBP and stuff. Nice. And uh, I was like, oh, a bumper sticker. Yeah. Like, that would be a good idea. Yeah. I don't know what it would be, but that's something that I don't really think about. The only, the only bumper stickers I really I really think about are those stupid little kids. Yeah. Like, there's like <laughs> six little, little people and then a couple yeah, adults. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I like the ones that they screw with it. It's like yeah. a dinosaur eating all the little kids totally. or something like that. Yeah. Um, so yeah, let's talk about kind of you and your career, man. Like you've been doing this long time, man. Yeah, how, definitely. How, how did things get started? So you like, you grew up in Roslyn. You're doing, like you're talking about racing in Alaska. Did you yeah. start as a racer? Yeah. Yeah. So um, I've been on skis since I was two years old mm -hmm. and uh, started skiing here in Roslyn, BC and uh, did uh, the Nancy Green ski race program. It's kind of like a mix between just skiing around with coaches on the mountain, skiing pal, that kind of stuff. And then there are like, 
Um, I don't remember, like, at the time, they're, like, uh, brush gates or whatever. They're just little punji gate things. Right. And do some little races. And um, then from there, I entered the Red Mountain Racer program. And that's, I think, four years is the junior division. Mm -hmm. uh, K1 and K2 at the time. They've changed those uh, names yep. now. And what was your, like, specialty? What were you were you just racing at that point? Or did you have, like, a, like, like ideas of, like, I want to do a GS or Super G or a slalom skier or... Um, I mean, mainly we trained slalom and GS, so mm -hmm. I would say that those were my specialties. We would do some super G training and didn't really get into downhill too much. Um, but I was definitely like a top three, top five racer for sure. And, um, ended up winning the K2 provincial championships in my last year, which was pretty cool overall provincial champ. And, uh, at the same time I was also doing big mountain contests and I would like to say, and as far as I can remember, was pretty dominant in those events. When's this? Like what era of age? Like 13 or 14 through 17 or right. something. Like I went to Crested Butte, did the Crested Butte Extreme. Was that when it was still like the Subaru tour? Like yeah. when they're the two separate tours? Yeah. 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 So I won, I believe I won all the junior division uh, contests that I did there. Right. And then I went into the adult category and I was leading and uh, it was like super important for me because I was like, I'm going from juniors winning. I'm going to win the adult division. Right. And um, I ended up falling on my last run with a huge lead. And uh, I didn't fall. Actually, I, I just like basically front flipped on the last hit. Punch front and yeah, back on and your Yeah, and just skis. like I was straight away just skiing right out. You're skiing out like, I meant to do that. And yeah, and <laughs> I was just like, no, but I had a big lead. So I was like, I'll be good. I'll, it'll be okay. And I ended up in third. So they like really docked me hard for that. Right. And um, I was like super upset about it. And I like threw my skis and went and hit under a rock. And like to this day, you know, people still remember me. Like, I don't know if it's Gabe Schroeder or Griffin Post. And he's like, yeah, I remember that day I saw you at Crested Butte throwing your skis at the bottom of the oh, run no. <laughs> and uh but you know i was a young kid super passionate put my heart into it so right. um i'm sure you got some like redhead jokes about that too yeah the yeah. redhead the yeah. redhead yeah. anger Fire, I, yeah. I get it too all the yeah. time man I'm, i have a bit of a i've had a bit of anger issues in my life where just, i wouldn't like, say snap yeah i wouldn't say that i have anger issues or anything like no. that but i've just been very passionate and sometimes passionate. it comes out right. a little bit yeah we wear your emotions on your sleeve totally i think maybe that's where people get confused with the you know the red head stereotype yeah so we're very passionate emotional human beings yeah, totally right we don't we don't hide anything no. like you know if we're stoked you know it. if we're upset you know it you yeah know, there's no questioning there's no second guessing so i understand you 100 percent understand you we can talk about this all night after it if we want to yeah absolutely <laughs> um so was yeah. that kind of like your your shift away from racing or did you like so pretty much the whole time i actually was focused on the big mountain riding so like it was like ski racing and big mountain comps right and like i was the kid in the race program that was like always trying to get off on a powder day and um you know every chance i could get i was like popping out of the race course and going in the park and riding through the park with my downhill suit on and just you know being kind of in some ways a little bit of a cocky little kid that had a lot of talent and mm -hmm. you know was just like hey look at this watch this right um so yeah i was doing all that at the same time and also my buddy and i uh, buddies and i were filming most of the time mm -hmm. and my mom was also really involved with uh filming as, as well so she'd come out and shoot some days and um, my buddies and i we would trade off filming as well and i'd be making little edits putting them on new schoolers right because there wasn't really youtube really wasn't a big thing by then no there was no such thing yeah because this like news it, it's funny that I, i'd like to someone i'd like for someone to go and do maybe them or someone that's connected to them but like a full deep dive into like the history of new schoolers yeah because it was even before facebook like it was oh yeah it was way before it was yeah. like social media before social media it was like when i was like 12 years old or something i don't remember the exact age that i got uh, flow sponsorship from Solomon, but it was probably around like 10 to 12 years old. Mm -hmm. And, uh, that's when I started my new schoolers account. So it was, um, you can still dig this up. I think like I've kind of dug it up in the last, like, I don't know, maybe five years ago or something. It's ski dash Solomon. And if you go on there, you're going to see some pretty funny comments from me. Like, again, I was like cocky young kid talking shit, just saying the dumbest stuff. 
Um, but that's what New Schoolers is still. Yeah. Maybe not as much as it was, but yeah. I, I remember like that was the joke. It was like, oh, it's just like this, this stupidest. I always, I always related to like, you know, when you're like driving in your car and you're by yourself. Yeah. That's when you're like the worst version of yourself <laughs> or just the shit you say about people that are driving. You can get away with it. Yeah. I always used to say that New Schoolers forums was kind of like that, but on the totally, internet before. Yeah. Like, it was pretty rowdy. Yeah. Yeah. I'd like post something and I don't know. I would like, I was really big into Seth Morrison at the time. So mm-hmm. I'd be like out there hucking flips or like trying Lincoln loops off cliffs and stuff. And like, I wasn't landing anything. And I'd be like, I'm 14 years old. That's progression, bitches. And they'd all be like, fuck you, man. You don't even land anything. And like, we'd just bash each other. Yeah, it was, it's pretty funny to look back on. That's pretty, That's amazing. I'm going to go dig that up yeah. for sure. Yeah. So you had your mom like filming for you guys. Were you editing the clips yourself? Just, yeah. Yeah, on the yeah. old Commodore 64. I guess it wasn't quite that bad back then. But like, like all those programs, like it was... A lot of work. Yeah, I was using Adobe Premiere at the time. Back then still, yeah. too, so you were kind of ahead of the game. Or maybe, no, it was Final Cut. I was always going back and forth between the two. Really? And that was, like, yeah. right right when it all started, yeah. really. Yeah. yeah, You know, that's kind of, like, the first real ability for someone at home to start doing that without having to, like, cut reels or, like, without film cameras or, you know, 8 mil cameras or 16 yeah. mil cameras and it's like what it's like right around the first time where people could really do this at home too so it was kind of like r- perfect timing i guess yeah yeah it was pretty interesting like before i was able to start putting music on the videos and posting on new schoolers like maybe it was like 2 to 4 years prior right i would be uh filming and then playing it back on the tv and recording it and then playing music and filming the tv of the tape that I had recorded to get music on my videos. And this was before I started posting on new schoolers at that point, right. the program I had the editing software, but like, yeah, I was super. Cause this was before, this is before like MP3s and like yeah. the ability to like download a music file like that. Yeah. Yeah. We were, that was CDs, amazing. So yeah. you just like set the camera up and shoot the television yeah. and then have like a stereo beside it. Yeah. That's amazing. So I'd so I'd record I'd take the the tape, right? And I'd play it to the TV and record it onto a VHS. Mm-hmm. And then I'd play the VHS back and film the TV with the CD player running. That's amazing. And like I don't know if any of those ever made it like onto the internet or anything, but I I, I hope I hope so. They're I hope they're on, on like new a high eight or something. I hope they're on new schoolers still. That'd be amazing. Yeah. No, those ones never made it on the internet. No. No. The stuff that's online is once I had an editing program, but like my right. export process was pretty bad. So like, it's like, I don't know, the interlace and stuff like that. Was Do you pretty, still have that stuff like in a box or on a file or something or like a, in his on his burnt CD somewhere or like, sorry, like a VHS? I do still have like a bunch of the old uh, content, I think. Yeah. I was like going through a bunch of tapes and like trying to digitize as much as I could. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's really, really cool. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. So that's kind of like... Like right along the same side of the style of like uh, same kind of starting point as your skiing career, you were already editing and, and doing all that kind of stuff. So you actually have a media company now. Yep. The yeah. Sh- Shred House Media. That's yep. the, the shirt and the like. I like the shred theme through all of the all the stuff that you've got going on. We'll get to all that, but yeah. like, so talk about the media company right now. Yeah. So um, I started up a media company called Shred House Media, mm-hmm. and um, I've been you know obviously filming for a long time. And, um, since I have been unable to find a sponsor over the last few years, I've really just been trying to make some transitionary moves, whether I, you know, find some sponsors and continue skiing in the future. Um, I just wanted to make sure that I was starting up some other processes and still keeping some income going. And, um, it's the transition of the, of the, the veteran skier, right? Yeah. Like how, like how many, how many skiers, very few were able to have a career as long as yours, right? And then they all kind of fade. You know, all, all get to that point where it starts to tra- there's the transition for lack of a of a better word. And I have I've had this conversation pretty much the, the entire length I've done this show is like, hey, what what do you got planned next? Yeah, right. Because I was always curious because I was it was in that stage where a lot of people I was talking to 
didn't need to have that plan yet or they hadn't gotten to that plan. Mm -hmm. So I've been doing this for like 10 years now and a lot of the friends and brother and like ski guys and brothers in arms, all that kind of stuff. They've all now are just getting to that point where it's like, Oh, we're in our forties. Now what are we doing? Right. So, um, yeah, it's kind of cool that you kind of have, we're aware of that. You know, a lot of people were, but a lot of stuff, some have been really good at it. Some haven't. Um, so that's really, that's really cool. So, and it's kind of almost full circle, right? Because you started at the same, you started doing that when you started skiing. Yeah. And was this just kind of a natural progression or just, it just, it just came into your lap or was it like a conscious decision? Um, well, honestly, I would say that I wasn't planning on it or anything. Like right. I would say more people around me would be like, Hey, what are you doing after? Mm-hmm. Oh, you could film. And I was like, I'm not thinking about that I'm skiing because still. I'm skiing. Yeah. yeah. Right. I was, I didn't focus on it at all. That little cocky kid's still buried deep in there. He's like, I'm still skiing. Uh, well in some ways, you know, it's like, I don't believe in like do or die because I, I don't actually want to risk my life, you know, in mm-hmm. that sense, mm-hmm. but it's kind of like do or die in the sense that you're doing what you're doing and you're focused on it and that's your path. Right. And then once it changes, you know, you make a, a direction change and um, start going. Right. There's no plan B. You just take the left fork or the right fork, depending on, you know, you just go the right, you just follow the route that you go on. Right. Yeah. So um, pretty much just uh, filming at this point and doing some local stuff, tourism work Mm -hmm. and uh, do a little work for a kid out of Casagar. Um, His name's Tyler. He runs a company called Stacked Films. I've been trying to get on with a uh, TGR and matchstick and uh, reached out to Alexia blank. And so far nothing has materialized. It seems like actually pretty hard to kind of break in. Right. It's like almost like, you know, you go from trying to get sponsors skiing to, mm-hmm. Hey, can I film for you guys? And it's still the right. same. It's like, you're kind of just banging on the door. Right, right, yeah. right. Just fi- trying to figure it out. So, what do you think? Do you have to put together like a like a like a reel now? Do you figure that's kind of like your next the next stage into that? It's just like, hey, look, this is I'm good at this. You know, I've been skiing my whole life on the other end of the lens, uh, working with photographers for the last twenty years. So I have a good idea of what they're looking for. I know exactly what's happening in the skier's mind, so I can see it from that angle, right? Thinking about like uh, like Brad Holmes, for instance. Right from the early MSP days, yeah, you know, shredding lines and wrapping on top of a car to <laughs> <Yeah>. now like <laughs> shooting, shooting film segments, right? So yeah. it's kind of that. This makes sense to me. Mm-hmm. Like Douglas, you know, obviously he had that transition through Solomon, uh, Solomon TV, where it was like oh, I'm still skiing, but now I'm filming, now I'm editing that sort of thing. So it's just kind of a natural, I think, smart move. Yeah. Are you enjoying it? Yeah, yeah, I like it. Um... I mean, I wouldn't say that like in the big scheme of things, it's like my main passion, Mm -hmm. Um, but it is, you know, what I got to be doing right now. So what's your main passion? Well, that's what I was telling you earlier. You're going to be surprised maybe, but um, what I'm the most passionate about these days is actually like more investing and stock trading and stuff like that. Really? So I've been putting a ton of focus into that for the last three years. And I was actually like doing a bunch of reading prior to that. So it's probably been like almost six years now of really really, um, learning that whole deal. So the multiple screens aren't necessarily for your editing projects, but they're for like watching the stock tickers and like, is that fair fair to say? Yeah, totally. For real? Yeah. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. Explain more. Like, are you into like Bitcoin and stuff too? Um, No, I haven't really been a crypto guy. No. Um, I definitely started trading, I'd say a little bit later, like than the initial crypto side of things and I don't have like a Coinbase account or any of those types of accounts. Mm -hmm. Um, If I was to trade crypto, I would just do it through an ETF, which is an exchange traded product. Right. Um, But mainly I just trade like uh, large to mega cap technology stocks. Really? uh, Yeah. Just focus around the market on all the different aspects that are moving. All right. This is fascinating to me. So (laughs) <laughs> do you do this? Is it like as a hobby? Are you doing is it kind of as a job? Like, are you at a stage now where you're like making a decent income from the trading? Um, I'd say it's mixed for sure. Like, I guess it's a hobby in a sense, but it mm-hmm. also like the goal is to become like a super good trader over time. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm starting to make some income for sure between like right now, actually just in general, the interest rate environment's pretty good. So it's really nice to be able to have a, a yield on cash, 
which is around 5% right now. And then on top of that, investing for the long term in ETFs when you get the right signals. And that has been profitable. Mm -hmm. And then I have a shorter term straight trading strategy, which is definitely quite a bit more challenging. And uh, I actually made like quite a decent amount through the COVID period. And then as a new trader does, I gave all of my profits back and uh, <laughs> lost a little bit. And so I'm getting back to the break even point and I trade quite conservatively on my short term and long term strategy, really, because I know that I'm still kind of on the beginning stages and uh, I can't afford to be like having massive losses. So, wow. Let's see. You lost me a little bit with some of the, the terms at the beginning because I don't I still I look at it and it's like it looks like looking at a foreign language. Like, how did you get into that? Did you have like a mentor or someone that was like, hey, check this out? Or was it just natural interest? Um, well, I had always had uh, some like long term holdings that my mom had bought for me when I was younger. So I was like, to some degree familiar with my account moving a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, but I never paid any attention to it. Like growing up when I started skiing and, you know, right. I didn't pay attention. Um, Someone would talk about the stock market like, yeah, I got some stuff. No, it was nothing like that. No. Yeah, nothing like that. Uh, and then actually the buddy that's staying with me, he got me involved in some lithium stocks in 2017, I think it was. Mm -hmm. And I kind of piled into those and had some pretty decent gains right off the bat because it was like right in the middle of a run. But it turned out to kind of be like the peak of that run. So I went through a pretty large drawdown and... Uh, that just like it all really piqued my interest though because I like saw the power of it. Mm -hmm. I saw what is possible, and then I also saw what it can do on the downside. So I learned a lot from that, right? And um, you know, told myself I would never do that again in the sense that I would not have that really large drawdown, right? But or basically uh, a loss. Yeah, yeah. But I, in this scenario, didn't sell it, and they ended up coming back and going up like three hundred percent or so. So <laughs> I was able to profit, and I did sell a portion of those positions, and I'm still holding the other half. Oh wow, that's so that's so fascinating, man. That's not, like it's, it's not a world that I'm familiar with really at all. Yeah. Um, is it like like is there a part of you that just is, is not just because it's like interesting and it's a money possible money making thing, but is it like that just the act of the trading and, and trying to figure out how everything works? Is that what gets you? I don't know. You know, like in the big scheme of things, I think I'm just like super fascinated by the ability to make money. Mm -hmm. And when I read like all these stories, um, there's like these books called market wizards and they're just like stories of different traders over time that have been really good at what they do mm -hmm. and just <clears throat> reading about the gains and losses that they have. I'm just like, wow, that is crazy. Right. You know? And they, then they tell you like, Hey, that you're, we're good, but you got to fail to learn lessons. Right. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Um, so really just like the gains and losses are quite fascinating. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then in the big scheme of things in my life, I really value freedom and I like doing the things that I like to do and I don't find them to be work, but I find having to work, it feels like work and I, I don't enjoy that as much. Right. Right. Um, so this doesn't feel like work. No, it's kind of fun. It's almost like playing a game. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if it's fun, honestly, it's like incredibly stressful, but, uh, <laughs> yeah, fair. I've learned a lot over time and I think that I'm getting less stressed about it and I know how to manage my downside risk and I know how to put on the exposure. Right. Um, so I definitely am slowly developing the process, but you know, in the big scheme of things, like it takes a while and you go many years without making any money at all. Right. It's you're like, you're basically like <laughs> making negative dollars on your time. And yet you just get up every day and sit there and focus. Right. And you're, you're basically finding your, I guess, either comfort level or, or finding your zone based on those experiences of wins and losses and, and just learning new things. And yeah. The, the, and like over the course of 10 years, the market's changed so much. And, and like you said, interest rates, there's so many different variables, which is always what's kind of, I found so daunting is like, there's just so much that goes into it that I don't know if personally I want to choose to the time to, yeah to spend on that. Like I used to have a land, a landlord, a landlady and Ruth was her name and she would get up at four every morning for the, when the markets would open in uh, in new york and she had this giant ledger and she would just like manually 
write it all down. Yeah, and this is like not that yeah. long ago, right? She's like, yeah. I'm like, why don't you use computers? So she's like, meh. This yeah. is how I like to do Each it. Each person does it differently. Yeah, she would just spend like four or five hours every day. Yeah. I think she would like eventually start trading online instead of like calling her dude and be like, yeah. hey, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Well, again, everyone does it super differently. So uh, it all depends on your own process, just like we all ski differently. Right. Anybody else in the ski industry that you talk to about this kind of stuff or like that you can, that you know, do does this sort of thing? I haven't really come across anyone in the ski industry that is doing it like I am. Mm-hmm. Um, I was down in Utah recently and I ran into Wallace and it sounds like he's an ETF holder. I don't think he trades. I doubt he uses, or I don't know if he uses charts, but to me it seemed like he is, you know, a businessman. He knows to invest and stuff like that, but I don't know if he's really like actively trading or using charts. But uh, a person that I just started communications with that's um, quite interesting is Shane Dorian. Mm -hmm. He's a professional big wave surfer. Oh yeah. Out of Hawaii. Yeah. Um, you know, he's, uh, 51 years old now. So he's like a legend kind of Kelly Slater type status. Right. Um, and we've been going back and forth and he trades like, like I do. Um, so it's been really cool to finally find somebody kind of in the same area of sports and someone that's like super involved and he's actually been trading for 20 years. Oh, wow. So he's got a lot of experience, probably a lot of losses as well. A lot of gains. A lot of, a lot of both. I mean, if you're going to be a trader, you have both. It's just like as a skier, you know, you're going to crash a lot. You're going to land a lot. Right. Like the amount of times I crashed when I was a kid was like, I didn't land anything. <laughs> and then I started landing some things and then I started landing more. And now it's like, right. I go out and land almost everything. Right. Yeah. So it's kind of like, I think that's the natural progression. Is that, do you see any more other, other parallels with your ski career with this new kind of, you know, interest in, in stock trading? Yeah. I found, um, another aspect is the risk management. Mm -hmm. So in stock trading, risk management's like paramount to Mm -hmm. anything else. Right. And in a way that really goes hand in hand with skiing. Um, and I'm a really great risk manager when it comes to skiing. Mm -hmm. I've had, uh, one major incident where I dislocated my hip in 2013. And other than that, my career has been like, that was the only year I was out for the season. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> and I've put together like, I don't know if it was 15 or so 15 or 16 film segments over the 15 years. Um, so I'm super proud of that. Mm-hmm. And, There's uh, longevity. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So uh, I'm a really good risk manager when it comes to skiing, and I think that it's a direct parallel to trading. Really? So I'm I'm kind of that fascinates me because like I'm not a gambler. Are you a gambler? No. Not at all. No. Nope. No. Interesting, because that fascinates me too. Because due to my limited knowledge of the stock market and, and things like that, obviously it's not. But I see it from my point of view as like, almost like gambling. Because I don't have that knowledge yeah. of, well, if I do this, the potential, if I, if I make this move, there are th- three potential outcomes, mm-hmm. right? I don't know what those outcomes are, right? So you, you're getting to that stage now where you're like, okay, if I do this based on that, this is potentially going to happen, right? So you've got that like level of, of knowledge where you can um, have take those calcu- they're calculated risks whereas for myself it's like well black put it all on black or put it all on red <laughs> yeah so. but see the point is you don't put it all on black or all on red right no you, exactly you split it up a little bit more than that and I mean like I guess I don't consider myself a gambler but maybe to some degree there's always a bit of a roll of the dice mm-hmm. you know whether it's skiing or trading or whatever calculated you're risk right yeah um, there's always an essence of uncertainty and unknown mm-hmm. involved and uh, I know in skiing, there's plenty of things where it's like, fuck it. And you just go for it. <laughs> you just, you know, when in doubt, point it out. Well, you got to do it, right? <laughs> yeah. Like if you're scared to do something, you're going to have to send it. Yeah. And uh, obviously you want to build up your skill set and your ability level to mm-hmm. match that. Mm-hmm. But it still comes down to it when you're going to go for it, that there's a bit of like, here we go. And just boom. Right. Throw right. Oh, yeah. Prepared to this point. Yeah. yeah. Good to go. It's blue. The camera's yeah. on. It's like the things that you've never done before. It's always a bit of a send it moment. Right. Whereas once you've done it, you have that experience. Yeah. So like when I was younger, there was lots of moments where it's like whew, getting all hyped up and doing it for the first time. And, uh, now I go and it's like, okay, you've done this before. You know how to do this. Just do it and don't think. Dude, yeah, that's 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 such a cool comparison. I love I love how when when people will talk about things that they do outside of skiing and how they can 
kind of compartmentalize them independently, but also understand how similar they are in certain ways. Like how do you approach them? Which is really cool. So do you do you think about that when you're when you're like we just spoke about it? But is that something you're actually you actively think about every once in a while? What's that? Just like how your ski career, how you would act, or how you would act or react within a situation, parallels what you would do while you're making a trade or while you're just sit, um, deciding on something. I don't really think about it so much while I'm trading, but more when I started trading in the process that I've gone through learning, mm-hmm. I then can look at skiing and be like, wow, look at all these similarities. Right. And so I can really bring a lot more to the table now on the skiing side of thing because of the knowledge that I've learned from trading. Oh, interesting. Do you do you trade um, or pay attention to like ski industry companies? As you mentioned, um, Ammer, which they put out their announcement, they're going to be going public soon. And you mentioned that earlier. Um, do you f- pay attention to that sort of thing? Maybe to get a better idea of what's going on in the ski industry? Or is that a thing? Or do you uh, just want to keep them separate? Um, mainly I just noticed that Amer was going public a couple of weeks ago and mm-hmm. I was like, Oh, that's interesting. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, they're a conglomerate. They own a lot of brands in the ski industry. And I just like to take note of that. I like to look at the market cap that they're looking to fetch. It just gives you an idea of the value of the business mm-hmm. and, uh, you know, the money that's rolling around within the industry. Right. Which if you talk to anybody in the industry, there isn't any which is yeah. incorrect. There's probably a lot of money in this industry. We just, a, lo- a lot of us just can't figure out how to get our share of it. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, I think it is definitely hard to say because we don't know where the money's coming from. You know, is it coming from running shoes? Is it coming from bikes? Right. You know, all of those companies, um, their different sectors are segregated. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, you know, the ski industry side of things maybe could be doing poorly while the running is doing well and the overall business could have a big market cap, but it might not be coming from skiing. So, maybe the ski budget isn't that big. Right. It is really hard to know. And that's kind of the frustrating thing too, I guess, for people working in an industry, but then also people like us who that's who we need to get our money from, you know, as a skier, like you just mentioned that you don't have currently don't have a sponsor, which I find mind boggling. Um, do you, are you willing to talk about that a little bit? Like, absolutely. Yeah. So you were with the most recently with Scott for a bunch of years. Yeah. I was with Scott sports for, uh, I think around 10 or 11 years head, right. head to toe. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Head to toe. And then, uh, was it just last year that you stopped working with them or they stopped working with you? Uh, it's been a couple of years and you know, it was like, I think they were ready for change. They were looking for younger athletes. Mm-hmm. Um, I think at one point they said, Oh, you're old. And I was like, man, I'm like 32. Right. At the time. Was this at what, like uh, 22, 21? Uh, I think it was in 2022, 21, 21. Right. And that's, around the, that time. And is that the season that you're filming and then Blank. get, and then you end up win, winning yeah. athlete of the year, mess, yeah. male skier of the year at IF3 that year? Yeah. Yeah. It was, uh, honestly a pretty crazy ride for me. Like, um, I find that a lot of the times with sponsors, it's so dependent on the managers that you work with. Mm -hmm. And so I had a really great manager at the time at Scott for quite a few years. And then they started going through quite a bit of management changes. So they were like rotating through team managers every couple of years. And there was two guys and they're like, okay, this guy's gone. This guy's in. Okay. We're training this guy. Now he's gone. And, uh, you're super subject. You're subject to, those managers and their viewpoints and their ideas of what they think. Right. Right. And so it's like, you're reestablishing yourself with your relationship with the brand, with that manager. And, uh, they just kind of try to step in and change everything on you. And so it's like, Hey, I've had this like process and this program and it's been working. Yeah. And, uh, it's just super funny, you know, like at the time they didn't want to work with TGR and they didn't think they were getting the value. And then, you know, I battle that for a while and, uh, eventually they pick up another kid and put him in TGR. So it's like, it's, it's okay. yeah. it's, you never you really know. know what, what somebody wants to do or, or, you know, like, like it's the same thing. I say it all the time and if, if you get, uh, someone in a position like that, right. And this is kind of, obvious. it isn't, this isn't like the norm, but happens a lot is in a lot of industries, but I've noticed here too, is you get that uh, person that moves into that role. And that first year, they're like, all right, sweet. You know, this is cool. This is a good job. Um, I'm going to take this first year and just kind of go with the flow. 
get my feet on the ground, figure out how this thing works. We're just going to kind of do things the way we did them last year. And then the next year, they're like, oh, sweet. And I'm the like, man, I'm hanging out with these athletes and I'm doing all this kind of stuff. Like, this is what I want to do. And they're going to start changing some things. Or they'll, obviously, there's there's people that have their own relationships and their own, um, you know, uh, their preferences to who they want to work with or why, just based on their own experiences or their own history with that person. Mm-hmm. So that second year, they're either like, oh, this is great. I'm going to do this thing my way or whatever. Uh, or that was great. We'll just do it the same way we did it last year. And then the third year comes around and after wanting to change things or do things their way, maybe the company's not letting them do it because of budget constraints or whatever. Like, Oh, this is kind of dumb. I'm over this. And then boom, they're gone. Yeah. And then you get a new person in. Yeah. Right. And it's just that revolving door, which is hard to really create those bonds and that relationship with, like you're mentioning where you can just say, Hey, are we, what are we doing this year? Rather than are we doing it this year? Yeah, I mean, I would say that my relationship with the new um, managers was definitely different than that. The one manager that came in, I found him to be super challenging to work with Mm -hmm. right from the start. And I'm sure that he found me the same. Right. You know, obviously, there's always two sides to every story. Mm -hmm. Um, But, you know, that was really challenging for me. Mm -hmm. And uh, And I like that you said that, too. Right. So, you know, that, that shows like a lot of like personal responsibility for that as well. Yeah, I know that I, you know, can be challenging to work with from time to time and Mm -hmm. uh, I always do my best and I've been in the game for a long time and I work really hard on my own personal um, communication and want to be the best I can but I know that I'm a bit of uh, you know like a lion in a sense so if you back me into a corner you're gonna have to deal with that right right fair and is that like just on you know ideas or or like obviously you have you have an idea of how you want to present present yourself and how you operate now or would you say like a lot of these maybe conflicts would be them wanting you to do something that you don't want to do or present yourself in a way you don't want to present yourself or or is it like based on like hey we're going to be shooting this we want to put you in a pink jacket or we want you to do less shooting with tgr and msps and start doing more yeah like like they did independent come. stuff yeah yeah for sure right yeah so like when um in this in it, in this scenario, um, I had a new manager come in and he was challenging right off the bat and he didn't want to work with TGR and I was like trying to still push TGR and I was also, you know, had an opportunity to work with Sherpas and Mm -hmm. it was like, I just felt like it was really challenging to try to get him to go in either direction. Right. And then ironically they chose both. So it was like a super banger year. I filmed with TGR. I had a project with Sherpas Mm -hmm. uh, and Christina Lustenberger. We did Children of the Columbia. Right. And um, with the Sherpas. Yeah, that was was great. Yeah, thank you. Um, I was really stoked on that project because over the years I have been in a lot of, you know, ski porn films. And that was really the first project that I'd been in that was much more creative and had a more of a storyline and I was one of the main characters a little more substance with yeah. you know a story with the message and ironically so my contract was coming up for renewal I was on a three-year term I think mm-hmm. and um you know I was like oh sweet like I just had a really great season you know was in TGR Sherpas and uh I think that was the first year that they reduced my contract but I can't quite remember it. Like some stuff is definitely vague. My memory is pretty bad. So like, you know, yeah, take some of it with a yeah. grain of salt for sure. Right, right. It could have been like, maybe they renewed the contract at the same rate, but they, instead of doing three years, did two. Right. That's what it was. Okay. So right, instead right. of three Less years, term. they did two yeah. with the option of one year renewal. Um, so everything, you know, in that sense was still fine. It's like, I've always been on three years. You got to put me on three years. Like, why are you doing this? Right. right. What's the point of this? Like to me, it just didn't make any sense. And there's that, what you were just describing, right? Yeah. So that initially starts conflict between us. Right. That, um, and then because after 15 years, if, if I can interrupt you sure. after 15 years, you're like, well, why, why are we going to two? Right. There's that precedent that we've set. We've mm-hmm. created this relationship. It's been working great. Mm-hmm. I've lived up to my end. Well, why is it only two now? Maybe totally. they didn't fully explain it to you. Maybe it was budgetary things. Maybe it was this or that. Maybe it was, you're getting old. Maybe they didn't communicate it to you in a way that you were able to, um, become cool. be at, that, you know, come to terms with it and understand it may not like it, but like, you know what I mean? Yeah. So, yeah. So, so I can, I can understand that fully. Yeah. 
Yeah. So that was pretty challenging for me and I did the best I could, but, um, that was what it was, was a renewal clause for the third Mm -hmm. year. Mm -hmm. And it came around and that happened to be the COVID year. And so they didn't renew my contract. Right. And I was like, of course you did that, Mm -hmm. you know? And so then that's when they cut my contract. So they reduced my contract by 50%. So I went from what I was making to less than I made at my first paid year. So the COVID year was 50%? 50%. So they didn't cut you fully. They were just like, hey, we got a... One year right? contract, 50% pay cut, and 50% reduction in travel and film budget. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was, I believe, like I can't, again, quite remember my initial contract with Solomon for the every day is a Saturday year, but I think it was like landing me back to that. And I was like, you can't do that. I got paid this level right. when I was like 19. And, right. you know, from a, you know, being grateful perspective of like uh, having gratitude that I still had the option to ski and make money, you know, like mm-hmm. I definitely could have had a bit of a different perspective there. Yep. Uh, but at the same time, I know the level of effort that I put in and I know how challenging it is to do what we do. Right. And I really felt undervalued and I just like, it was tough. Right. You get to that point where, yeah, I a hundred percent can understand it. Right. Yeah. Cause you've, you've done everything you've needed to do. Right. You're a veteran of the sport. Right. And you're like, well, what's happening now? Right. Mm-hmm. Do you feel that because you were with Scott, like head to toe for a while and then with COVID, it was that was an it that also was a huge issue because you know you hadn't maybe had been having conversations with other companies you hadn't really been open or you know like there's you know there's people like say let's say Adma right every three or four years and through his career he's kind of switched mm-hmm. Solomon Haley Hansen now he's with uh, Outdoor Research um, you know Black Crows now he's on RME right so he he's he's one of those guys that kind of jump around where you get like say a Macintosh. He's North Face vocal mm-hmm. for his whole career, right? Mm-hmm. So you got those guys that kind of jump around, or all the Solomon guys, they tend to go head to toe and they want to keep them in house. That's kind of the same thing you were doing with, with Scott, right? So when you're rolling through and everything's fine and you've gone all of these years with this expectation of, hey, there's really nothing wrong here. There's nothing that indicates that this shouldn't continue. Well, you don't need to go and start looking elsewhere, right? So then this happens and you're like, well, shit. Is that kind of what happened? Like, is that, do you, do you agree with that? Where you're like, well, I was committed to you and I was, you know, loyal to you guys. And now it feels like maybe you're not reciprocating. Um, and now I'm kind of stuck because I was all in. So I'm not going looking for other stuff. Like I'm not moonlighting and saying, Hey, I've, I've got it good at Scott, but what can you do better for me? Right. It's probably not something you were doing. So when you get this news, it hits harder because you're like, well, what the hell, man? Yeah. Um, I would say there was an essence of that for sure. Mm -hmm. Um, I always kind of really liked that aspect or the idea of an athlete being with a brand for an extended period of time. Like you're talking about Macintosh or you look at even like Conrad anchor or Mm -hmm. any of those guys and you know, they're with the company for almost or all of their career into old age. Yeah. And, um, I really believed that I could be one of those athletes right. and I really valued that aspect, um, because you know, you're, you're growing with the brand, you're working your way into, you know, iconic status. And, uh, it's just like a nameplate that you are Scott branded, right? Right. Yeah. And you have that loyalty and mm-hmm. they, um, you respect the skill set that you have and they want to keep, you know, um, you on the brand, not only for everything that you've done, but also, you know, the ability to mentor younger athletes and Mm -hmm. just kind of the bigger picture. Right. Um, but you know, it just didn't work out that way. And, uh, we continued for a few years like that and renegotiating one year contracts and Mm -hmm. every year it was a total battle and it was not a lot of fun at all. And, you know, just the way that it goes. And, uh, then it came to, I think, I don't know if I did like two or three years like that at that 50% reduced rate. It might've been like the TGR year and then it switched over. I I went out with the guys at blank Mm -hmm. and I was lucky with Alexi to be like, Hey man, I have reduced budget. This is 
all I can do because I think they did cut my budget down even more. They paid me the same, mm-hmm. but they reduced my travel and film budget again by fifty percent. So like right. I was working off like five thousand dollars, right for for my travel budget, and Alexi's giving me a deal to be in the film, right. Mm-hmm. Which I'm super grateful for. Which worked out for you both because totally, you had an amazing segment, yeah, award winning segment. You. The words right over there, yeah, yeah. It was a, it was an awesome year, and it was super fun to be back with kind of like the OG crew. Mm-hmm. Um, so that year happens, and I was like, okay, I'm having all these issues with Scott. Like, I'm gonna go out and do the very best that I can. I'm not gonna go out knowing that like. I, I wanted to, if I'm going to go out, know that I did the very best that I could and that I didn't leave anything on the table. Right. And, uh, you know, I'd been chasing the best male performance award for years after I first won it. In like 2009 for, or something? Was yeah. It? Like, like early, early. Yeah. For every day's a Saturday, like when I came on the scene and just blew up uh, and had just, I'd been nominated numerous times over the years, you know, lost to guys like Sean Pettit, maybe Sammy Carlson, um, but just had always been chasing it. And it, it materialized again in that year with blank. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it makes sense being out there with Jeff Thomas, same guy that I filmed with and made the every day is a Saturday. Mm -hmm. Um, so it was really just like super full circle in that sense. And also being back in Whistler, really kind of getting back to my roots, like filming with TGR was fun and was great experience doing all different types of skiing, skiing with different, uh, athletes that I really looked up to. But at the same time, it wasn't really my type of skiing in a sense. Because, like, I have numerous styles. Mm -hmm. I have, you know, uh, the pillow kind of mini golf style. I've got the backcountry jump style. And I also have big mountain style. And um, that was where, going back to Whistler, I was able to really capitalize on those aspects of my skiing. All three of them. Yeah. And um, so I was really happy I put in the as much effort as possible. The snow conditions were tough. I was out there with Jonathan Rollins and, uh, we were just giving it everything we got. And every day I was like, today's a day to get a shot and I'm going to give it everything I have. And normally I would be a little bit more conservative and, you know, work with my risk management because the conditions were so rough. Mm -hmm. But I knew that I was like on the chopping block. So I was going to do everything I possibly could. And wow. I was, you know, out there doing switch dubs, dub tens, like into snow that like Jonathan's like, dude, I don't want to hit that jump. <laughs> and I'm like dub ten in it or, you know, just like making basically, every day count. Basically backed into a corner, right? That's kind of how you're feeling. You're like, I got to, I got to throw down here. Yeah. But I also came to that season with the approach that I also wanted to have fun mm-hmm. and I, you know, really wanted to kind of in a way bring back that every day is a Saturday vibe and also enjoy it. So at the same time as like, I'm on the chopping block doing the best that I can, I'm also enjoying it and really absorbing the experience. Right. Yeah. Cause you knew this might not last or were you like, this- I just, I just wanted to have fun with it. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> right on. Yeah. So then you win this award, yeah. male, best male skier of the year, and now you're without a, part, a ski partner? Yeah, so I won, um, I think now it's called Standout Male Performance Standout, of the Year. Yeah, it is, yeah. And I was like super emotional about it, and it's like... I actually have a video on my phone I'll show you when we're done, because I, I handed you the award on stage. Yeah. I've got the award and nice. like in front of yeah. 900 people at the yeah. Fairmont, which is a pretty cool moment. Yeah, yeah. And like a ton of my peers and people that I look up to. So it was a, a really great experience. And when I go up and I get the award and I I'm, I do believe in the universal power, you know, like you... Um, like manifestation. Manifestation, yeah. To a degree, right? Like mm-hmm. obviously like there's lots of things in life, but you know, I do like to... Uh, imagine and manifest and I like to believe that things come to you at the right times right and so it was like in my mind I'm like the universe threw me a bone because like before I even got there I was like come on throw me a bone just throw me a bone and I won the award and I'm like sitting in the chair and it's Sammy Carlson Kai Jones Craig Murray I think yeah and myself yeah and I'm like there's no way like <laughs> you're right these guys are all killers heavy hitters yeah. yeah and um you know my name got called and i was just like holy shit um the universe threw me a bone and uh yeah i really thought that that was like some firepower that i could go and mm-hmm. be like hey look you know i've won this award i've been in the game for a long time 
and uh, I have a lot of value. And I talked with a lot of companies and I went back to Scott and they're like, Hey, we love what you did. And you've been like really good with your activation. Um, and, uh, we're going to offer you less. Yeah, of course. <laughs> right. And the I was familiar just refrain, like, right? what? It's just, yeah, it, you know, it's who knows, right? Like what everybody else is, what anybody else ever thinks or what they do. So let me ask you this. Right. In, in my mind, I think it's crazy. You win an award like that and then still have struggles, you know, finding a partner or a sponsor or whatever it may be for whatever reason. Maybe you were offered something, but it's like kind of a joke. Off. It's like a non-offer. We'll give you this and this kind of like or or, or, yeah. or at levels that you may not be familiar with. I don't know those conversations that you've had, but, you know, I'd, I'd still like to see you on a film every year because you've proved it. Right. But if if right this is kind of it for the pro ski career. Are you comfortable with it ending that way that it did? If it, if it was going to end with that award in your hand as like a nice, it's like winning the, it's like, it's like winning the Stanley cup in your last season or, you know what I mean? Your last season in a big leagues, you win, you win the title, right? Or have you thought about that? If that's if maybe if that's it for me, that's a pretty sweet way of, of winding it up. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, if that was the end of my ski career, if right, in, big if, yeah, big if for sure. I mean, it's been a couple of years now since that. Mm -hmm. I think we're going on the second winter since the award. Um, if that were the case, yeah, it was a great way to go out for sure. I gave it everything I had. Mm -hmm. I can walk away saying, you know, I did everything I possibly could, and I'm grateful to have won that award after chasing it for the entire 15 years from winning it the first time mm -hmm. and uh yeah i mean it's like in its own way it's a storybook finish for sure right uh winning it as um a up-and-comer blowing up on the scene and then winning it in my final year yeah so you know i always kind of think about that it's like do i really need more um but at the same time i really do enjoy the lifestyle right it, it may I, not be do i need more but do i want more Right. Yeah, and do I want more? Do I need more? It's kind of both. It's a two-part question. Mm -hmm. But I do enjoy the lifestyle, and you know I am good at skiing, and uh, I enjoy being out in the mountains, and I see a lot of other guys my age. Well, I shouldn't say a lot, but I know there are a few other guys my age that are still out there, and I know Macintosh is still doing it, and I'm like, I don't know why I can't still be out there. Yeah, right. Um, exactly. And I have learned a lot over the years and, you know, continue to progress and change both on skis and also personally. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, who knows, keep the options. Who open. knows? Maybe it's not the end of the book. It's just a chapter, right? Yeah. You're, you're currently in another chapter. Yeah. You may start another one, right? Well, I do know Kai Peterson. He was sponsorless the year that I was mm -hmm. shooting blank and I actually stayed at his place for a month. Right. Uh, super grateful that he offered up his place. He was gone uh, fishing. Mm -hmm. And I was like, damn, dude, like, this is so crazy. Like, I'm having these troubles and Kai's sponsor list. Like, what is going on? Because in my mind, you know, Kai is one of the best. He's like steeped in the roots of skiing. Right. Right. Um, his dad, Trevor Peterson, mm -hmm. you know, pioneering. We had him on, on the, the show coast. a couple of weeks ago, <clears throat> a couple yeah. weeks ago. And he was, we asked him a lot of those same kind of things with like Kai shapes and him turning down big deals to kind of progress and work on the ski pro his ski just to see what he wanted and then f what happened from there and then moving forward and it's just it's it, that's why i love these conversations because it's fascinating to hear everybody's experience and what they do with it and how mm -hmm. they turn it around and how they view it and 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 that sort of thing so and in the comparisons like you said like with kai and yourself at the same time two of the best skiers in the world right who are like well what's happening yeah so for me it was really interesting to see what kai was going through and you know he still had his struggles over the last couple of years he was able to land a deal with marker vocal del bello and then you know we were still going back and forth talking to each other and he's like yeah i'm still trying to find an outerwear brand right and uh i was like okay yeah that's crazy man like because I just think Kai is such a legend in so many ways. And, you know, not only is he a great skier, but he's like such a mountain man. He has so much experience and he also, you know, puts together his own productions. Like he has so much value. Mm -hmm. And so when I look at a guy like that and I think of all these brands that he's going to trying to get involved, it's just like, 
you know, what is going on. Yeah, it's it, it, 100%. I've had these conversations a lot, <clears throat> and, and a lot of it's just figuring out, like, a lot of the, I guess, the questions maybe in your mind or in my mind when I approach people, it's like, why don't you get it? Like, just get it. <laughs> you yeah. know what I mean? Like, yeah. or, or I also get to a point where, like, oh, maybe I'm not presenting what I can do well enough to these people but it, yeah. it really doesn't i think a lot of it doesn't really have anything to do with you it's just how that person thinks perceives things yeah it's, it's you never know right all you can do is control yourself but at the same time you're still like what the hell yeah it's interesting <laughs> like you know i talked to a lot of different brands and honestly it was pretty challenging like mm -hmm. everyone's kind of like oh yeah we love what you do but you know we already have all these athletes we're right. not really looking to bring anybody on like that's right. the story of my life really like i was super lucky with solomon and scott to be honest mm -hmm. Um, but then talking to a lot of brands, I also find that like a lot of the managers are new. They may not even be like super, uh, steeped in skiing, so to speak. Like mm -hmm. they don't have a lot of experience or knowledge within the industry, within the, the sport and its history. That's a good point too, where they've come from another, another, like, uh, a job similar, but from a different industry. Yeah. Like. I mean, I would also say there are managers that do know, mm -hmm. but I do find a lot of managers that don't. Right. And so like, even as an example, the secondary manager at Scott at one point, he was like a hockey player. Right. You know, it's like, mm -hmm. what do you know about what we're doing? Right. Nothing. Right. Right. Um, so, you know, there's just so many nuances to it. And then also like with these new managers coming in, you know, I do see so many young skiers out there these days and there's definitely a lot of great young talent. And I think they have a ton of value and I see them, you know, on the world tour and they're winning events and all that kind of stuff. And so I see the drive, mm -hmm. you know, to be picking up these younger athletes. I also still think that there's room for athletes like myself and Kai and, uh, you know, we have a ton of experience and I mean, I still won the award at IF3 against younger athletes and older athletes alike. So it's like, you know, when I look at it, it's like, I'm still just as relevant. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So that's, you know, it's one of those things where... It's just the the na navigation, right? Like y you really can only do what you can do, right? Yeah. And I understand like the frustration of like, well, I shouldn't have to prove myself because I've already proved myself, right? Yeah. When you're talking about people coming in from other industries, like you don't necessarily want to have to go out of your way to prove who you are because you've spent the last 15 years doing it, which is probably a bit of a frustration as well. But at the same time, we're at that stage where maybe you just have to do it you know what I mean? Play, yeah. play the game a little bit, maybe reassess your needs and your wants out of what you're getting. You know what yeah. I mean? Like, you know, back to a hockey analogy, same sort of thing, right? You get those big contracts and then near the end of your career, you start signing those. When you're, when you're talking about, you know, the one year deals, smaller deals, that mm -hmm. sort of thing. That's kind of how it, unfortunately, that's kind of how it rolls, right? So it's yeah. maybe a matter of just adjusting the goalposts for your, you know, expectations. I don't yeah. know. Is that, I mean, is, that's that a fair, is that a fair thing to say? Yeah. I mean, um, I definitely have adjusted my expectations in a sense of like thinking about it in a different light for sure. Mm -hmm. Um, but also still, you know, you know, kind of like what the standard of living is these days and right. you know, inflation has gone up and when these companies are trying to offer you half of what you used to get paid and you're like, I should be getting paid a third more mm -hmm. just based on inflation. Right. You know, I think these companies also try to take advantage of young athletes and I don't know, like in the big picture of things, like I do think the younger athletes are probably like some of them are getting paid well and others aren't. And, um, you know, I just think there's so much to the industry, right? but, uh, they do a hold the upper hand. Cause like how many of these young kids have any like business sense? Maybe some of them do, maybe some of them don't. I don't know. Right. You know, Same sort of thing when you kind of came up too, right? Like back then they were throwing money around a little bit more freely. Yeah. I would probably think that young kids are getting the same pay that I was getting back then personally. Right. It's, even to this day. It's just, they're not going to get to the level that, you know, a lot of you guys got in those mid to late aughts, you know, the 2006s it's to 2010s, to right? Like that was like the golden age to be a ski pro. Yeah, it's it's hard to say. I honestly think that it's still probably possible, and I think that mm -hmm. the kids are probably getting it. Yeah, I hope so. Yeah, I hope so. I think that that's it's like few and far between, though. It's like you're either one of the few, mm -hmm. or you're not. Right. But I think it's always been that way. Like I was one of the few. Right. Right. Like you, we could make comparisons of different athletes right now, and ones that are doing really well potentially, and ones that we know aren't. Right, from right. a monetary perspective, exactly the ones that are grinding and they're like, "What the heck?" Right, and that's the only thing that kind of gets me about the industry is like, 
I just know how much effort people put in, especially young athletes. Mm -hmm. And I know that it's like, if I can only do this, then I'll get this contract because they're trying to make a living. They want to be a big name. Mm -hmm. And then it rolls around and it's like, here's 10 grand again. Here's 10 grand again. Right. And it's like, these kids are out there risking their lives on a daily basis. Like it has serious implications when it comes to risking your body in the mountains. And I just really feel like it would be cool if, you know, the companies maybe like pared back a bit and actually paid better salaries to the up and coming athletes so like rather fewer, than just have, like trying to spread it out. Have fewer athletes and more less less fewer athletes that make little uh but more like but have like a core that make like a core set of athletes that make more like have a core team that makes mm-hmm. a little bit more and yeah. fewer semi pros and and ambassadors and then that sort of things that we're yeah, saying because the industry like has spread out so much and i totally get it from a company perspective they want as many eyeballs as they can right and like i totally get it and i don't know what their budgets look like so maybe i'm totally <clears throat> off in my way of thinking mm-hmm. but um it would be nice to see people paid for their risk right because like and it's funny you say that too and i'd never really thought about this with skiing before but you get these kids that are you know putting themselves out there and giving her and giving her and giving her and I wonder if like what you you brought this this up earlier is you know taking potentially kids getting taken advantage of or companies taking advantage of people. Well, you get this kid that's really given her. Maybe they don't see them as super marketable, but they're like, well, they're still giving her. Well, let's just give them this, right? And because we know they're still going to do it. I think it would be cool if really in the sense the managers were more upfront about it and they're like, hey, dude, you're not the one. Mm-hmm this is what we can give you and this is what it's going to probably look like. Obviously things can always change. So you can never like, you know, be like, this is what it's always going to be. Right. You have to know that there is uncertainty and maybe it is going to change. But I think that the managers being more upfront about it would be good. And I know that that's hard for them because they have to talk to a lot of athletes. They have to turn a ton of people down and they're also doing the best that they can. Like I do give them that, I know they're doing the best that they can in right. the way that they can and that their hands are tied from the upper levels and, you know, they're just as much on the chopping block as we are. Right. So I don't want to make it sound like, you know, they're the bad guy. Right. But, um, but that does, that's a great yeah. point. Just being like straight up honest be like, we don't see this for you. Yeah. Which like, you know, this, that may the, be disappointing, but right. like, <clears throat> instead of just, know. instead of just offering that level yeah. of, of pay or, or, or budget, yeah. just, and, and so just this is what we have for you, but maybe just say it in blunt terms and be like, this is where we see you rather yeah. than this is what we have for you. Mm-hmm. This is what's in our budget to give you, but flip it in a way and say, this is where we see you. This is what your value is to us rather than that's a harsh thing to say, mm-hmm. but it might be the best thing that could be said on their behalf, but then also for the rider too to be like, okay, like... I'm not asking for more, not craving for more. And, and that's, that's it. Like there's no gray area kind of thing. Yeah, right? Cause it's kind of like the athletes always like hoping something better is going to come. And you know, that's how we kind of like keep going in life. Cause we always hope for better times right. We're working towards mm-hmm. better things. And so that's all good, but it's nice to have a bit more of, uh, you know, um, like you said, tempered expectations. Right. So back to what you were talking about with, you know, as you were kind of progressing your career and you're getting these budgets cut, if someone had come to you and said, hey, this is where we value you now, whether you believed it or not, we, we know where you believe your value is. Mm-hmm. If they said, hey, this is the budget we have for you, which is what they probably did, yeah. instead of saying, this is where we see your value, mm-hmm. if they had said that straight up to you, would that have changed how you approach things? Would well, you have been like, I appreciate <laughs> you telling me that straight up. I'm going to go do yeah. this, right? I think that is pretty much what they told me. And, you know, I just kept fighting it because I'm in a way sometimes, Fair you know, enough. I'm just going to fight it. Yeah. Uh, and when you only have that one option. And again, I find like you mentioned Abma is like he can switch sponsors. Like mm-hmm. I've talked to like so many companies and it just doesn't materialize. So it's right. like and then I look at myself and I'm like, what is it about me? Right. And, you know, there has been. Um, like over the years, there has been a few instances, like one or two where I've had like a run in or something. And then it's like, I get labeled as, Oh, he's hard to work with. Right. And then, 
you just kind of get labeled with that. And I don't know if that's like followed me around Mm -hmm. because I honestly feel like I'm a pretty good person right? and I work hard on myself. And I know sometimes there can be challenging conversations, but overall, like, I don't think that I'm a bad person or that I'm like incredibly hard to work with. But you know, if you're tough to work with, we're both going to be hard to work with. Right, right, right. So like, it has to be a two part process. Mm -hmm. Um, So anyway. I don't know. That's kind of that aspect. I think we could probably move on to some other things really. Yeah, no, that's cool. And I appreciate you being like, so like open to chat about this kind of stuff too, right? Like normally, you know, people won't be so specific with their careers or their lives and they'll keep it kind of loose, but like, this is refreshing for me and I appreciate you being able to chat about it. Yeah. Well, I'm, uh, you know, happy to talk about it because I would like people to know the challenges as well. Right. And it's not even just your challenges. It's across the industry for kids, totally. kids coming up or whatever. Like someone's going to listen to this and they might reach out and be like, Hey, can I ask you some questions? Yeah. Like what did, what would you do in this situation or how, how did this affect you too? So that's, I think super helpful. And you know what? Maybe the next phase is kind of a combination with, you know, shred house media or, or, you know, maybe it's not like I'm not a pro skier anymore, but I am going to be working with this company to maybe produce stuff for them. Yeah. Right. Maybe that's the new transition. You know what I mean? Yeah. Who knows? I mean, I find like everything is so competitive nowadays. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. So it's like kind of trying to get your foot in the door on anything. It's like you really got to like totally have your game like way up here. Right. Um, And then, you know, hopefully they want to spend the budget. Right. Really. Um, But, you know, there's like so many different things you can do. And it's just kind of like following the different threads and. Right. Right. um, Interesting. Enjoying it. Well, talking about like kids maybe come and ask you but like you're a mentor now right you've been doing this for so long and you were talking about uh, is the shred posse uh so i'll just like quickly encompass like a few of the other things that i do so um you know i, I have the shred house media aspect which mm-hmm. is filming i do the trading stuff um shred posse is like a small clothing brand that i've started mm-hmm. which again like it's not really where my passion lies. So in a sense, I don't put a lot of energy into it, right. but I like to wear the product. Right. Right. Um, but you know, I think that that has some great potential to grow over time. Like I see people throwing up the horns all over the place yeah, right. and I think it's like really universal across brands. Mm-hmm. And, uh, it's just like, I kind of keep it as a thread being like, okay, it can materialize when it does. Right. Right. Um, and it's, and you get to start here. It's like a cool like rallying point for Rosalind as well. Right. Totally. Yeah. Um, so there's shred posse clothing brand. And then, um, I just do some stuff locally. Like I actually, uh, have been coaching with Mm -hmm. my buddy, Ryan LaChapelle, who started the team giver free ride club. You know, is that the, is that like the, um, like, like what's their free ride or like, so that's like Rosalind's free ride club for like kids to go up through like, cause there's the Canadian championships is tomorrow here, here in red. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of like the free ride program that's starting to be developed here in red in red. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, the team giver free ride club is our local free ride team Mm -hmm. and, uh, we will have kids tomorrow in the red mountain comp, Cool, which is going to be super cool. Home court advantage. Yeah, totally. Right. Um, I definitely had that when I was competing here. Uh, but yeah, so we'll have kids up there tomorrow. I'll be coaching with Ryan and, um, it's been super fun being out with the kids and in a way it feels really full circle. Cause like, you know, I was, it was different for me because I was in the race programs, but like I grew up as a kid in Nancy green, then ski racing and doing the big mountain stuff. And now to be able to go out and ski with the kids and like get a fresh perspective too, and be like, Hey, where do you guys want to ski? And like right. going back into the same areas that I used to like when I was a kid and it's just really fun hanging out with them. And I have a lot of knowledge that I can impart, whether it be like ski technique or mental aspects and the risk management side of things. So, uh, I'm happy to, you know, really, um, give them that knowledge that I have. Have you been surprised yet by like, cause you just said, this is what I can offer you, but these kids are probably going to ask you questions. You never even thought that you could like help them out with, you know, like these kids are learning how to free ride through this process and their coach is Dane Tudor. Like that's pretty fucking cool. Right. So they're like, well, what about this? Like, do you, have you been surprised by some of these kids questions? <laughs> uh, sometimes, you know, they'll be like, what tricks can you do? And I'll be like, oh, well, I can do this and this and this and this and this. And they're like, what's that? Yeah, and it's right. like, oh, well, I'll show you. And then I like pull up my Instagram and like show them a backflip and then show them a, a seven and a dub 10 and a switch triple cork. And they're just like, their eyes just explode. Like they've never seen anything like it. Like a lot of our kids are like, 10 through 12 13 mm-hmm. and then we have some older kids like uh, 14 through 16 yeah but the younger kids it's really where they're just like oh my god 
This is the best coach ever. Yeah, because they can, cause they can see like they can see they can see that it it can be done. Yeah. Right. And it's not just I'm not just watching a dude do it on a TV screen. I'm actually sitting on the chairlift talking to the dude who did it, and I'm gonna get all I'm gonna steal all of his information. <laughs> right. Yeah. I don't know if the young kids at that age are really thinking that, um, but it's also like I do enjoy coaching the older kids because they're a bit more advanced both uh, physically and mentally right right um so they are able to take in the knowledge Mm -hmm. whereas the younger kids they're kind of like oh let's ski around and it's like okay you know like we'll work on some threes or something do you have any kids in the in the uh program where you're like oh my god like this kid's gonna be something special um yeah i mean there definitely are a few kids for sure that have some really great uh talent we have um some local kids that grew up here uh um that are super good skiers that's really cool. I yeah. got a killer coach, eh? Yeah. Uh, where can people go to find the Shred Posse stuff? Yes, yeah, so you can go to shredposse.com. Mm-hmm. I have a super limited uh, supply on there right now. I just kind of like revamped the website and changed over the process to direct printing. Oh, like drop shipping kind of yeah. stuff? Yeah. yeah I'm, so. tr- I'm just now starting to figure out that. We've never sold merch with the podcast. And we're just finishing up a website and we're going to launch... I think hopefully next month, maybe. I hope. Nice. <laughs> I hope. Yeah. We'll see. It's been eleven yeah. years. I've never sold a T-shirt. Yeah. So I mean, like, I keep it pretty basic. There's right. like not a whole lot of product on there until I start getting more orders, you know. Um, but I also just need to get on there and like put some more products on there. I've got like some hats, T-shirts, hoodies. Fun. Um, and you know, at this point, it's super small. And like, if it was ever to be able to grow into something big, mm-hmm. then I would love to be able to really. Um, you know, sponsor athletes across different industries and actually, you know, treat it more in the way that I see it, which is like, you know, let's have a sick team. Let's pay these guys what they're worth. Let's right. like pay them for their risk mm-hmm. and let's work with them and, you know, really right. value them um, as athletes and as people. Right, right. And then, yeah, interesting. Well, there's so much to, to talk here, man. We've gone like a <laughs> long time. We're going to have to do a round two. Yeah, totally. Um, so I'm hoping. I don't know. I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to stick around for tomorrow, but I think I'd like to. But we'll figure it out. Yeah. Well, I don't think the weather's going to be awesome, but, it's been, you know. It's, that's been the theme this year, I guess, yeah. everywhere, hey? Yeah, it's about as rough as it could possibly be at the moment. Yeah. We'll just, uh, I guess, <laughs> have to figure it out, man. Yeah. Well, I always like to just, you know, wake up every day and look outside, and some days it's raining and warm, and then the next day I wake up and there's pow everywhere, and I'm straight to the hill, just hucking right. off the cliffs. And you wake up and you eat your coffee, like, looks like I'm trading today. And, yeah. Or it looks like I'm trading pow. Yeah. I like that you, got, the, you yeah. got that option. Yeah. I mean, I also like to go to the gym and go swimming and, uh, I definitely stay on an exercise program. You bike I, a lot too, right? I do bike and I ride motocross as well in the summer. Um, and I also ride my snowmobile now just for fun because I'm not skiing in the backcountry really in that sense. So I just go out on sled days. and hey, Sometimes and, it's nice to leave your skis at home when you're on your sled, hey? Oh yeah, I love going sledding. I mean, I'm a pretty good sledder, so I enjoy it. And uh, yeah, I just like to keep a good balance and maintain discipline and, um, you know, the way we are today is going to shape who we are in 10, 20, 30 years. So, you know, I want to also grow into my old age and know that I lived a good life and, um, you know, I'm healthy when I get there. That's awesome. Thanks dude. Yeah. Thank you. You've been listening to the low pressure podcast, the podcast for skiers. This has been a Redmark media production. 